Hello, this is Eva Anson, welcoming you to this Bite Size Bio webinar, which today is sponsored by Leica Microsystems. Today's presentation is titled Cell Dive Transforming Tissue Research with Open Multiplexing, and it's being presented by Katie White and Michael Smith from Leica Microsystems. Katie is the product manager for the Cell Dive Multiplex Imaging Solution at Leica Microsystems. She studied mechanical engineering as an undergraduate at the University of Delaware and completed a master's degree in biomedical engineering at the University of New South Wales. Katie began working with microscopes in 2008 as a field application scientist for a high resolution wide field microscopy system. She has worked as a sales specialist and global product support specialist for high resolution, super resolution and high content imaging systems. Michael is the application manager for CellDive. He completed a PhD in the genetics of DNA repair at Columbia University and a postdoctoral fellowship in genome integrity and cellular aging at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where he leveraged microscopy to understand the real-time dynamics of DNA homeostasis. His passion for answering biological questions using imaging technologies led him to his current position, where he pro provides technical expertise and customer support for the CellDive platform. As always, we will have a question and answer session after the presentation. So please type any questions you have into the questions box which appears on the bottom of your screen and I'll put them to Katie and Michael at the end. The recording of the webinar will be available at bitesizebio.com. So now over to you Michael for the presentation. So thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, so today to give you a, a working example of how cell dive can help to transform your tissue research uh, with multiplex imaging. I'm gonna focus on a pancreatic cancer example. Um, pancreatic cancer is one of the highest mortality rates of any cancer. The pancreas is surrounded by a lot of highly vascularized organs, such as the duodenum, the bile duct, and pancreatic cancer often invades and metastasis, metastasizes to uh, even more distant organs, uh, like the liver, the peritoneum, the brain, the kidney, uh, and bone. And unfortunately, conventional chemotherapy plus radiation or in advanced diseases, chemotherapy plus targeted drug therapies, um, they can lengthen survival, but really they have a fairly low success rate. Uh, the five-year survival rate for these patients is about 40%. Um, and I think this demonstrates a lot of need for improved therapies for all pancreatic cancer patients, uh, including new uh, novel therapies such as immunotherapies. So we're coming to understand more and more um, in the current kind of scientific milieu that uh, tumors are not monoliths. Um, they're structurally and um, organizationally complex that have lots of different um, tissues and systems operating within them. And kind of collectively, all these tissues and systems are known as the tumor microenvironment. And it's becoming increasingly clear how essential understanding that microenvironment is for under, uh, developing and using novel therapies. Um, different regions of the tumor, like the stroma, can behave diff differently from other regions. Uh, in the context of the disease and the contributions of all these different regions can underlie the often quite different responses that different patients display when treated with these emerging therapies. Um, beyond just the stroma, um, there are subregions within the tumor that can adapt to certain metabolic conditions, such as uh, the presence or absence of uh, strong concentrations of oxygen. So you can have regions that are both normoxic uh, and hypoxic within the same tumor. Um, and often these hypoxic subregions within the tumor can adapt to those conditions and actually gain dominance over the other tissues um, by uncontrolled cell growth. And as a result, these hypoxia adapted tissues are often more aggressive. So here, just using a small subset of biomarkers, um, we're gonna be looking at five biomarkers, two tumor, uh, two blood vessel and one stroma. Um, you can see that hypoxic regions of the tumor can be effectively classified compared to the normoxic tissue. Um, and it's important to note here that five biomarkers is exceeding kind of the conventional traditional microscopy methods for analysis in the same area of the slide. And really five markers only scratches the surface of the information you need to understand the biological complexity of these tissues. Um, so clearly more biomarkers are needed to characterize the cell heterogeneity in these complex tumor microenvironments. Um, so what we wanted to do in this case is leverage the power of cell dive to look at many more markers than just five and probe other biological pathways in concert to see how these uh, tumor cells might be surviving and becoming more aggressive. So we have a kind of general hypothesis to explore with this uh, experiment, which is that the tumor cells in these hypoxic regions adapt to avoid uh, programmed cell death and evade the cellular immune response, which would otherwise curtail their growth. 
So I'm going to show kind of a bird's eye view of a few different kind of biomarker uh, panels. All of these are imaged in the same slide in the same experiment, just kind of separated so we can look at different biological pathways to show that the different uh, phenomenon that you can look at in a single cell life experiment. So first, uh, we have a collection of markers to explore uh, metabolism, such as aerobic glycolysis and the Warburg effect. And what this is going to show is the regions of the tumor that are hypoxic and normoxic. And to explore the apoptosis question, we've layered in some biomarkers such as caspase um, to look at which cells are undergoing apoptosis at a higher or a lower rate in the same tissue. And lastly, we're going to look at some traditional immune cell markers to explore the recruitment and um, differentiation and uh, multiplication of immune cells within that tissue. So when we have all this data, um, the experiment becomes very complex because we have many biomarkers and many cells to explore. So what we are able to do is perform a clustering algorithm. Uh, first, we'll do some cellular phenotyping and then apply a clustering algorithm uh, called the UMAP to this data to separate these cells into different functional clusters and then explore kind of which biomarker uh, systems are present in each of these clusters. Uh, and so this is done by the layering of dozens of biomarkers uh, to identify these differences that are not going to be obvious from just looking at a few biomarkers. Um, and so in this cluster diagram, each biomarker is along the x-axis and cells are clustered based on biomarker expression similarities across the tissue. So for example, based on the epithelial markers PCK26 and AE1 and the UMAP spatial relationships, we're going to be able to identify normal pancreas and visualize the clusters that are separate um, from the tumor cell clusters. So that would be numbers four and six here. Um, and if we click again, we can see um, normoxic tumor tissue and a click again. And now we see hypoxic tumor tissue. So they all cluster separately. And one of the major determinants here, we're just looking at this um, along the axis of GLUT1, which is a marker for those hypoxic conditions. And you can see that when GLUT1 is not present, um, it's not commonly present in the normoxic normal tissue, nor is it present in the normoxic tumor tissue, but in um, Cluster three down at the bottom, you have a high GLUT1 expression indicating that hypoxia. So we're able to cluster these away from the other cells in the population. So where does apoptosis fall into this? Um, so we have a couple of markers that we can look at to kind of explore uh, the presence of apoptosis uh, undergoing cells in this population. So we're going to look at BAC and caspase 9s kind of two traditional apoptosis markers. And we can see that even among the uh, non-tumor tissue within the pancreas, there are some cells that are low in apoptosis and some cells that are high in apoptosis. And what we find is that in the normoxic tumor tissue that expresses a low level of GLUT1, we find a higher level of apoptosis. But if we take a look at the tumor tissue that's hypoxic, what we find is a lower level of these apoptotic markers, indicating that by some mechanism, these hypoxic cells are avoiding apoptosis. And lastly, we'll look at immune cells. So we're going to use um, four different markers. We'll use CD3. Uh, which is a, sorry, three different markers. CD3, which is a T cell marker, as well as CD4 and CD8 to identify those subpopulations of T cells. And we can see that they cluster away from the uh, clusters eight and nine, cluster away from that hypoxic uh, tumor tissue in cluster three. So these regions are kind of immune cell deserts, um, and there's very limited recruitment of immune cells into these hypoxic regions, which might be another reason that they're able to survive and become more aggressive. So our finding uh, using this uh, panel is that cancer cells in these hypoxic regions do in fact adapt to avoid apoptosis and they simultaneously are able to evade immune activity. So the impression I want to leave you with here is that, um, you know, obviously tumor cells and tumor microenvironments are incredibly complicated and there are multiple biological pathways that are kind of at play and interacting with each other in these cells. And if we were limited to just looking at five or six biomarkers, we wouldn't be able to understand any of these interrelationships. We wouldn't understand that the hypoxic tissue also reduces recruitment of the apoptotic markers or also, um, you know, uh, lowers the recruitment of immune cells. But through doing a multiplex imaging experiment with cell dive, we're able to see how all of these uh, biomarkers interrelate to each other and come away with a deeper understanding of the underlying biology here. So cell dive can reveal these relationships uh, between many different types of biological pathways that just wouldn't be clear uh, using other imaging methods. So what is multiplex imaging? Can we, can we zoom out and kind of understand what uh, this, this, this kind of emerging technique is? And so I think there are a lot of definitions floating around for what multiplex imaging means, but I think the basic understanding is any type of imaging experiment 
that is able to um, look at more markers than a traditional microscopy experiment. Um, and so that might be, you know, traditionally four or five different markers. Um, and so anything beyond that could be considered multiplex imaging. So we have kind of a differentiation uh, based on the number of markers. Um, so a lower uh, or a more midplex experiment might look at something like six to 10 markers. And this might be accomplished through something like spectral and mixing. Many different fluorophores are present in the sample and they're able to use software and optics to separate those uh, different um, spectra and then visualize the different markers. If you wanna go beyond just six to 10 markers and look into, into many more like we've done in this experiment here, uh, it's important to use something like an iterative hyperplex system. And so what this uh, does is it uses multiple rounds of staining and either bleaching or dye inactivation or stripping of antibodies to iteratively probe and revisualize the sample. And you can see in these images at the bottom that multiple biomarkers are being layered on top of each other with each round. And this really allows you to get past the kind of uh, traditional limitations of uh, these platforms and look at many more markers, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100. Um, and cell dive is part of this family of technologies. So there are a lot of considerations, and I'm sure people who are considering this space probably have a lot of questions about how to get started. Uh, and there are a lot of questions that can go through the mind of the researcher, um, such as, can I get started quickly? Um, these seem like complicated experiments. Is it gonna be something I can pick up or is it gonna require uh, lead times to bring in the technology that are kind of unacceptable in a fast moving research space? Can I design studies to answer my unique question? Is this gonna be flexible enough to be able to be applicable to what I'm studying? Uh, you know, researchers are looking at very um, specific issues and specific parts of tumors. Is this gonna work for my unique system? And am I gonna be able to adapt this study? If my research needs change or grow uh, over time, am I going to be able to be flexible with this? Or am I gonna be locked into some kind of uh, kit or method that might not work uh, throughout the lifetime of my research? Can I return to my slides for downstream processing or more imaging? Uh, I'm sure we've all had experiments that we wish we could have gone back to and just looked at one or two more things. Um, some of these methods are destructive and especially with precious or expensive tissues, that can be a real challenge. Um, so am I gonna be able to go back and have the flexibility to add in a few markers if my research question evolves during the study? Is the workflow reliable? Is it gonna be something that produces uh, the same kind of results every time on similar tissues? Or is it gonna produce swings and batch effects that are gonna make analysis more challenging? Can I trust the data? Um, is this gonna be replicable from the beginning of one study to the end of a study, which could be months or years later? Is it gonna be replicable in a, in a different lab? Uh, is it going to be replicable many years later? Uh, can I trust the data? And am I gonna be able to scale up if I need to? If I start an experiment that looks at 10 slides of tissue, uh, but I decide I wanna move up to a hundred or a thousand, is this technology gonna be able to grow with me and my needs? And lastly, am I gonna get the high quality image data I need for robust analysis? Of course, everything um, that's extracted from imaging data sets depends on the quality of those images. And if these image quality isn't uh, good enough, then we can get uh, incorrect or unreliable uh, analysis from that. So am I gonna have the image quality to actually get results I can trust? So I'm going to um, kick it over to Katie White, our product manager here at CellDive, to tell you more about how CellDive can answer and help you with some of those important questions and uh, bring the world of multiplexing to you. Thank you, Michael, uh, for a great introduction to the power of multiplexing. And in this next section, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about CellDive specifically. So what is CellDive? Um, at first glance, you might assume it's an automated imager, but really it's a complete multiplex imaging solution. And this graphic here shows the components of the CellDive solution. The first component is the validated antibody list. And this is a list of over 350 rigorously validated antibodies that have been proven to work with the CellDive process. And doing this type of validation takes considerable time and money. So access to this list is a huge productivity jumpstart. Second, we have the, uh, the patented workflow for CellDive. And this iterative staining and dye inactivation workflow is what allows us to stain an image a sample repeatedly with new biomarkers in each round. Next up is the acquisition software. 
And built into this software is a huge amount of technology around image calibration and correction. And these calibrations and corrections ensures that these large ROIs that we collect for CellDive can be seamlessly stitched and precisely aligned to enable downstream single cell analysis. Um, the next is the, the CellDive Imager, and it is a very robust automated microscope with a number of customizations to make it a dedicated tissue imager, including an onboard barcode reader, five channel capability, and compatibility with automation systems for sample loading. The final component is the analysis software. And in this space, we've partnered with Indica Labs and offer their tissue pathology software called Halo. And this software is very well known in the tissue analysis space for balancing power and ease of use really well. So on that last slide, I talked through the components of the cell type solution, but that doesn't really explain how cell type works. And what you see here is a high level overview of the cell type workflow. We begin our process with your tissue sample. And the first thing that we do is we prepare those samples using a well-defined slide preparation process that it includes a patented antigen retrieval technique, but also more standard processes like de-waxing, clearing, et cetera. So after the slides are prepared, we put them on the imager and we use quick low magnification scans to define the region or regions that will be imaged for the study. When that's complete, we get into the iterative part of the study, the imaging rounds. And first, we stain with up to four diconjugated antibodies. We perform our biomarker imaging, and then we inactivate the dyes or turn them off with our chemical dye inactivation solution. So this process doesn't remove antibodies or photo bleach the sample, so it's very gentle and tissue preserving. And this is the step that allows us to stain over and over with new antibodies. When that's complete, we image our autofluorescence, um, our autofluorescence signal again, and these images are used for computational autofluorescence removal, and then that concludes an imaging round. So those four steps are repeated for different biomarkers until the study is complete. From there, images are used um, as input to image analysis programs to do comprehensive segmentation, classification, and spatial analysis of the sample to answer research questions. So in this section, I'd like to explore in a bit more detail what we really mean when we say that CellDive is an open multiplexing system. So we know that getting started with multiplexing can be overwhelming, um, especially when it comes to building panels. And to help you get started with confidence, CellDive comes with an extensive list of 350 antibodies that have been rigorously characterized to ensure they will work with the CellDive process. And you can leverage that and build your panel entirely with antibodies from this list, or you can use the, cell, the proven uh, cell dive characterization process to validate your own antibodies. Um, additionally, being an open multiplexing system means that we're agnostic to the method you choose for multiplexing. So if you'd like to use a third-party multiplexing kit, or you use one of the open source multiplexing methods, you can do that with cell dive. It's also important to mention that we don't dictate where you source your antibodies or reagents. So you're free to use the suppliers that you like and that you trust while simultaneously keeping your costs down. Finally, I think the real power comes from the fact that you can combine any or all of these strategies to build your completely custom panel. Uh, for example, um, you can begin with an eight marker multiplexing kit that covers maybe some core immune cell markers supplement with a number of markers from the cell dive validated antibody list, and then add in a few of your favorite antibodies that you validated yourself, and voila, you have a biomarker panel that is completely customized to your specific research question. With cell dive, um, you're also free to choose what you'd like to image. So depending on what you're interested in, you can decide to image your whole tissue and select a single area up to 20 by 45 millimeters in size, which is huge, or you could identify smaller regions of interest to examine specific structures. Imaging areas aren't constrained to any size or shape either, so you can image exactly what you need, but only what you need. Set of protocols are also incredibly comprehensive as well. So they detail all steps of multiplexing workflow, including benchmark steps, QC steps, and of course, imaging steps. 
And this ensures that the right processes happen at the right time for the right samples. Uh, but even with the most well-designed protocol, you might need to pivot or change something while the study is in process. And that's possible with cell dyes. So maybe early examination of your data gives you a new avenue to explore. It's not an issue. You can add a couple more rounds of imaging at the end of your study. Or maybe a great new biomarker of interest becomes available a year after you complete a study. And if you saved the slides, you can pull them out of the fridge and you can stain them again. The cell dive is never too late to adapt your study design to respond to your research questions. So uh, scalability and efficiency is important, important to everyone, not just as it pertains to multiplexing, but to scientific research generally. So how can cell dive help you become more efficient and help you scale your work? So when you think about scalability, if you're like me, you immediately picture sort of hardware for automation. Um, but without a framework and software to enable that automation, it kind of doesn't work. Uh, the automation hardware needs to know what to do with your samples. Uh, and this tracking becomes even more complex with multiplexing where you may have many samples or even studies running concurrently. And somehow you need to keep track of what to do next with each and every slide. And that framework or backbone of multiplex study management was one of the driving forces behind the development of the cell dive acquisition software. So with input from an integrated barcode reader in the imager, the software automatically tracks slides through a multiplexing study and performs exactly the right action for that slide at exactly the right time. In addition to tracking multiple slides, the, the software can handle multiple studies at a time making it per perfect for a multi-user environment or just a busy lab balancing multiple studies or cohorts at the same time. The software also plays a big role in compatibility with automation. Once a protocol is defined and regions are selected for all slides, there is no user interaction required in subsequent imaging steps. The slide is loaded, the barcode is read, and the system knows exactly what to do according to the protocol. And this allows for easy integration with automation solutions. Another aspect of this cell dive workflow that allows for scalability is how slides can be processed in batches. And to explore this in more detail, let's, uh, let's examine this graphic of the iterative portion of the cell dive workflow. And in this workflow, we have two bench work steps where we actually manipulate the sample. And those are the biomarker staining and dye inactivation steps. And we have two imaging steps where the slides are imaged. And with cell dive, the bench work steps happen off the imager, which allows for batch processing slides through those steps. So if we take a closer look at what that manual workflow would look like for maybe three slides, this is kind of what we would see. So each of the scientist icons around the outside of this cycle represents a touch point in the cycle, and its size roughly represents the duration of that touch point. So if we start from the top left at biomarker staining, which is a benchwork step, you can see that there are a couple touch points here that are kind of longish in duration. And as we move into biomarker imaging, we have three touch points. So in this example, we have one for each slide that we're processing, but they're very short, just the amount of time to load each slide into the imager and push go. And that pattern is repeated on the bottom half of the cycle for dye inactivation. A couple longer touch points to perform dye on dye inactivation on all slides at once, and then short touch points to load the slides into the imager one by one. And this batch processing workflow is advantageous for a few very important reasons. So number one, since all slides in a study can move through the bench work steps together, you can have confidence that they've been treated as similarly as possible. You'll be staining with the same antibody solution on the same day. Uh, the environmental conditions will be the same. The incubation times will be the same, et cetera. The workflow also enables you to scale your research, even if you don't have the means to automate the process. So whether you're working on three slides or 10, the bench work portion of this workflow doesn't change much. The touch points get slightly longer to address more samples, but it certainly doesn't scale linearly with the number of slides. And finally, the fact that bench work steps happen off the imager allows you to keep that imager working as much as possible. It doesn't have to sit around while slides are being stained or going through dye inactivation. 
that time can be used for other slides, other users, and other studies. So, so what about automation? In my years of talking with researchers in this space, one thing is a recurring theme. Everyone wants automation and multiplexing, but not everyone wants the same automation. So from those who would like to just set it and forget it for two to three slides, to those that need complete staining and imaging automation for cohorts of 50 or more slides, one thing is very clear. A one size fits all approach to automation just doesn't work. And this is why I think it's so important this, in this space to enable automation, but allow you to dictate what that automation looks like based upon the throughput you require, your budget, or your access to existing equipment. So for CellDive, automation is enabled by the ClickWell CoverSlip free slide holder. And ClickWell is unique because it allows you to perform all of your bench work and imaging steps right in the ClickWell, or allows you to repeatedly remove and reinstall slides from the ClickWell for processing elsewhere. So what are some of the ways that the CellDive workflow can be automated? So in looking at this manual workflow, the thing that jumps out to me first, especially if you'll be imaging a larger number of slides, would be to eliminate the touch points in each of the imaging quadrants. And uh, ClickWell was designed with the footprint of a standard multi-well plate, so nearly any robotic arm can be integrated into the system to automatically load plates into and out of the imager. And with that type of automation, the touch points for biomarker labeling and dye inactivation, our bench work steps, they wouldn't change. But we've already discussed that even with a larger number of slides, those steps can still be done for all slides in a batch fashion. And after the bench work steps are complete, there would be one touch point in the beginning of the imaging segment to load the slides into the input stack for the robotic arm and initiate the imaging process. From there, slides would be loaded into the imager and imaged one by one until all slides have been imaged. And that one automation step increases the amount of unintended time really significantly. So that means that for the entire imaging time for all slides, you're free to perform other tasks. It can also enable overnight imaging um, to allow you to take advantage of every hour of every day. We also hear from researchers that they would like to automate the bench work parts of this process, and, and that's possible with, uh, with ClickWell as well. So the repeatable slide positioning and ability to easily install and remove slides from ClickWell allows for the use of commercial auto stainers to automate staining and dye inactivation. And this diagram shows what that workflow would look like when you combine the robotic arm with a commercial auto stainer to automate the bench work parts of the process. Similar to the manual flow, workflow, the slides would be processed in the auto stainer in a batch fashion. As for uh, touch points, in this type of workflow, there are just four at each of the transitions between the auto stainer and robotic arm or vice versa. And again, this expands the un unattended time between touch points, even with a very, very large number of slides. The last thing about this open approach is that it also enables your level of automation to scale with your research. So maybe today a manual workflow is fine, um, but in a year you get a huge grant for a major study. And with CellDive, you can do that type of scale up just by adding supporting equipment, not additional imagers. So we do have one more automation option to make this process even a little bit more hands-off. And this is a new solution that we've developed exclusively for CellDive with advanced solutions like Sciences. It's a customization of their BioAssembly Bot 200 platform to completely automate a full half round of uh, uh, staining and imaging for CellDive. And the cool thing about this solution is that it's a robotic arm with interchangeable attachments. In this case, an automated pipetter and a plate gripper that allows us to automate both staining and imaging or dye inactivation and imaging to further expand the unattended time. And with this solution, there are only two touch points per round. So you load up to 15 slides, you set up the system with required reagents and tips, and you push go. On this slide, we see um, the bioassembly bot working on a set of slides in ClickWell slide holders. In this scenario, the uh, benchwork stuff in this scenario, benchwork steps are done directly in the ClickWell by pipetting reagents in and out. So we can do the entire staining or dye inactivation process right in the ClickWell, and we can do it for up to 15 slides at a time. Fab also comes with pre-configured bio apps that cover all the main workflows for CellDive. So 
Uh, that includes staining, dye inactivation, and even an image-only mode that allows Bab to just act as a simple plate loader. So there's nearly no overhead to getting started. And as you can see here, Bab and Celldiver are integrated seamlessly. So Bab performs all the steps for staining or dye inactivation, then can load samples directly into the Celldiver imager, and the imager does the rest. It will carry out the right imaging actions based upon the slide's barcode and the protocol. So essentially, you load the slides, and when you come back, everything is done. You just get to review final stitched images for quality control. Finally, these custom workflows were designed specifically to keep the imager busy. So anytime there is a slide that's finished imaging, there is another slide right behind it that's ready to start. Last but certainly not least, how do you know you can trust the data you get from CellDive? Uh, multiplexing has exploded in popularity in recent years, and it seems like every day there's a new system or new product in the space. And like on microsystems might not be the first company you think about when you think about spatial biology, but CellDive and the technology that it's based upon has a long history in this space. The CellDive platform and the workflow has been in development for over a decade. Um, in fact, the first paper was published way back in 2008. And since then, countless hours from both the developers of the technology, as well as prominent early adopters worldwide, have gone into testing, refining, and validating the entire CellDive workflow. There have also been uh, 40, over 40 peer-reviewed publications that leverage CellDive in recent years. And finally, um, as a, a real-life application for this type of technology, CellDive has been used in biopharma since 2015 as a robust way to stratify patient populations for clinical trials. So this iterative staining workflow is the backbone of the CellDive process. So it would be the backbone of your research as well. Uh, for something so important, it's imperative that it just works, and it works the first time, and it works every time. And the years of research that have used this process guarantee just that, so you can get started with confidence in that workflow. Over the years, collaborators have run some huge studies with this process so that we know it works for 60 plus biomarkers. The largest study that was done used over 120 biomarkers with this process. It's also proven to be very gentle, so at the end of your studies, your tissue is still intact and can be used for downstream processing uh, to be stored or to revisit in the future. And finally, our patented two-step antigen retrieval has been shown to provide better antibody binding and increased staining intensity for better quality data. Next up is the CellDive imager. And, and this, this is what Leica does. This is what we're known for, making high quality microscope systems. And the CellDive imager is no exception. This purpose-built, fully automated tissue imaging system was engineered for precision, speed, and sensitivity to make sure our images match, uh, match the quality you expect from Leica, uh, but more importantly, uh, so that you get robust downstream analysis results. We can also capture nearly the entire imageable area of the microscope slide, so you aren't limited in the size of the tissue you would like to examine. And finally, we all, we all know the pain of imaging a very, very large sample and then having just a few out-of-focus frames to ruin it. And the CellDive, take, uh, CellDive imager takes advantage of advanced slide mapping and multiple autofocus auto routines to ensure every frame is in focus every time. So uh, I'm a microscopist. That's, that's sort of my background. So I love to look at beautiful image data. But the truth of the matter uh, is that the images that we get are really a means to an end. It's the data, the analysis results that we get downstream that we use to generate insights. And while that's absolutely true, I don't think we can minimize the importance of good image data to start with, because even the most advanced analysis pipelines can't fix poor images. It's that whole garbage in, garbage out. And the CellDive software takes the guesswork and the effort out of getting to your final image. Our custom calibration plate and automatic calibration routine was developed over 10 years to produce seamlessly stitched and precisely aligned multiplex data. And the images here are a great example. So what we see here is 
uh, subnuclear registration structures from different rounds. We have KI-67 from round one of imaging and DAPI from round three. And even those, those were imaged at two totally different rounds, we get that perfect registration between the channels. And the best thing about the whole process, uh, the calibration and correction process, is that it's completely automatic. You run the automatic calibration routine once a month, and those calibrations are automatically ap applied to your images such that all you see is the final product, a corrected, stitched, and aligned data set. These calibrations also enable correlation across multiple samples, multiple studies, and even multiple imagers. So to, to summarize, uh, Michael showed us a great example of how multiplexed imaging can answer complex questions that can't be fully explored with other imaging methods. We also highlighted how open multiplexing with CellDive lets your research dictate how you run your multiplexing study, including how to build your antibody panel, which antibodies to use, and even the level of automation that's needed. Finally, I hope we've shown that regardless of how you choose to proceed with your study, the data quality you get from CellDive doesn't change. You'll always get crystal clear whole tissue images that enable you to deepen your understanding of the tissue microenvironment through outstanding spatial mapping of single cells. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we appreciate your time. We can turn it over for some questions. Thank you, Katie and Michael. Um, that was an excellent presentation. And before we start with some questions from the audience, we actually have some questions for the audience today. I'm going to um, pull, pull up a few quick poll questions. So we'll just take a few seconds per question. Um, so you should see the first question on your screen at the moment. Um, do you currently use multiplexed imaging? And the answers are of course, either yes or not currently or no. Um, so I'll give you all a few seconds to take a look at that. Okay, I think we've got a good balance there now. It seems to have slowed down. It looks like um, about half of the people here aren't currently using multiplex imaging, but are interested in learning more. Um, I, can, I can show you the results. You should be able to see them now. Um, and then the next question is a little bit longer, but don't worry about that. Um, here you go. How do you analyze tissue sections? So that is for the people who are currently doing this kind of work. Um, I'm going to launch it now. What method do you currently use to analyze tissue sections? So multiplexed imaging, chromogenic imaging, traditional fluorescence, mass spectrometry, or other. And I'll give you a few seconds to look at that again. You'll get a bit longer for this one because it's a longer question. I can show you the results for this one as well. Um, so currently the most popular one is traditional fluorescence and then multiplex is the second most popular one. So thank you for answering these questions. Um, and I think it's now time for you to ask the speaker some questions. So I'll start um, reading out the first question. Now I'd like to invite um, Katie and Michael to join me for this Q&A while I pull up the questions. Um, so the first question I've got is, uh, how long does it take to validate an antibody and how much does it cost? I can, I can take that one. Um, so it, it does tend to vary, um, but uh, it, we say that it takes roughly about 30 hours of labor and about 1,500 to 3,000, and that's US dollars. Um, and most of that is for you know, the actual antibodies to test. My, my cat wants to join me. Um, <laughs> uh, and if you validate using the, the cell dive process, it is a three-step validation. Um, and along the three steps, we test for both uh, specificity and sensitivity of the antibody. We test first as sort of a primary secondary pair. We do a second level of testing uh, with directly conjugated antibodies. 
Um, and then from down selecting from there, we also do some testing uh, to ensure there are any antigen effects from our dye inactivation solution. Um, but yeah, uh, about 30 hours to do that and 1500 to to $3,000. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, the next question I have is what type of image correction does cell dive perform? Uh, I can take that one. Um, so cell dive does a lot of uh, image corrections in the background that are kind of handled directly through a uh, calibration plate that's inserted into the imager along with some calibration software. So this all kind of occurs without much manual intervention. Um, and there are a, there's about 10 different corrections that are taking place through this calibration plate. Um, there's like a, a gridded, um, a grid that's looked at to do kind of objective centration, distortion corrections. Um, there are flat field slides performing flat field corrections. Um, there are stage alignment checks uh, built into the system as well. Uh, intensities are calibrated. Um, and importantly, the DAPI channel in every round is used to actually um, register the images with each other and perform the image alignment. And so this kind of results in a high quality uh, corrected image without a ton of manual intervention by the user. I see. Thank you so much. Um, the next question um, is, can this system also scan and analyze immunohistochemistry slides besides immunofluorescence multiplex slides, or is it, does it only work with fluorescence slides? That's a, that's a good question. So it is, I mean, it is designed to be a, um, a multiplex, multiplex imager for, for fluorescent samples. Um, so we don't do any chromogenic imaging on the system itself. We do have a way to generate virtual uh, H&E images using fluorescence, uh, autofluorescence from the tissue. Um, but no, it's not, not a straight chromogenic imager. Thank you. Um, the next question, do you know if there is a database for antibodies that work in species like dogs, cats, horses, et cetera? I can, I can take that one. So um, there, is, there is not a database. Um, so the, the validated antibody list, that's something that's provided to customers when they purchase the system. Um, and on that, the vast majority of those are human uh, or have been tested in human tissue. There is a, a list of antibodies that have also specifically been tested in mouse tissue. Um, you can expect that there would be a large amount of cross-reactivity between the antibodies on the list with other types of tissues, but that's something that we can look to, you know, vendor data about, but then also do some, some testing. Okay. So I guess you can, you can help people if they have a very specific um, species that they're working with. Yeah. Um, the next question, um, Michael, I think you can take this one. Um, does this technology work with any dyes that you stain tissue with, or are there dyes that the technology won't work with? So the dye inactivation technology works with cyanide dyes, cyanine-based dyes. Um, there are a couple um, that will also work as well on kind of a case-by-case -case basis, but cyanine dyes is what the, the, te the technology is designed to work with. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I've got one question left at the moment, um, unless anyone else has a question at the last moment. Um, so the final question is, um, to do multiplexing at scale, do you have to automate? So I can take this one um, after. <laughs> My cats, the ever-present work-from-home partner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine is behind me sleeping yeah. right now. So, <laughs> um, so uh, do, you have to, do you have to automate to scale? So no, you really don't. Um, you certainly can. So we have two two early adopters that have used this system for, for a lot of years um, that both do pretty sizable studies. Um, one that doesn't automate at all. So no plate loading automation, no staining automation. They do that all manually. And another one um, that has chosen to do all of the, the uh, sample manipulation manually and just has a robotic arm for loading slides into the imager. So those are two Two examples of customers that have used this product for a number of years and have either implemented no automation or just sort of one aspect of automation and still do uh, do work on 
a very large cohorts of patient samples. That's good that it gives you the option to kind of adapt, choose what yeah. you need to need it for. Exactly. Um, yeah. Well, I think that takes us to the end of the seminar here. So thank you again, Katie and Michael, for a very illuminating presentation and a great discussion afterwards. And thank you, of course, to our sponsor, Leica Microsystems. And finally, thanks to you, the audience, for taking the time to attend and listen in. So until next time, good luck in your research and goodbye from all of us at Leica and Bite Size Bio. <laughs>